This video is brought to you by the lovely guys over at Robotoys. For all your Hasbro, Takara, third party and knockoff desires, Robotoys has you covered. For 10% off, use the code DOCTORLOCK10% off at the checkout. Now on to today's diagnosis. Disclaimer! I'm the other one, you bastard! Did you plug my wizard Tinder profile because there is a Jesus Krebs? Uh, are you okay there? Hmm. I have a feeling this insanity will dissipate once the title screen rolls. Give me a second. That's how I said, brother. The creation of Earthrise Optimus Prime is a bit of a weird one. There are two ways of actually looking at it. The first is that Hasbro planned all of this from the beginning, that they deliberately released the Siege version and then the Earthrise one afterwards, knowing that people would buy both. But I've always been a bit sceptical of this hypothesis. As sketchy as Haztac can be sometimes, I find it really unlikely that they would deliberately make a Prime they just released redundant after one year. The second, although far less prevalent, I find is far more likely. It's the fact that there were several complaints about Siege Optimus Prime not being G1 enough, and as such Hasbro responded in turn with the figure that we got. It might seem confusing to fans of this channel, but G1ers know where to respond with their criticism. Facebook, Twitter, TFW, and Cybertron. Those four areas are where you need to go if you have something to say to Hasbro, and the 1980s community knows it, and as such, Hasbro listens. And yes, they may not stand for the majority of this fandom, but since they know how to complain, they're the ones who are driving this franchise forward. To me, this is very disappointing, because I, like many people, wanted Siege Optimus Prime to go more in the Cybertronian direction, more so than the Earth direction, but we have what we have. Ultimately, I just review toys based on how good they are as their own thing, regardless of what they're trying to do. So, putting my biases in the bin at the door, greeting Cybertronians, I'm Dr. Lockdown, and today's diagnosis pertains to Earthrise, WFC, E11, Leader Class, Optimus Prime. So, interesting thing, Optimus Prime is in the leader size class, or rather price points given that sizing means jack shit these days. Yet somehow he has circumvented the complaints that Astro Train underwent simply by the fact that he's an Optimus Prime. I distinctly remember having to frequently argue that Astro Train was fully worth his $80 to $90 price tag, whereas Optimus has managed to get off mostly scot-free in comparison. Perhaps it's because people have mellowed out, but I definitely think that the character choice has something to do with it. Not that I'm complaining though, it means less arguing on my end. And does Optimus Prime feel like a $90 toy? Well yes, but to elaborate Earthrise Optimus Prime transforms into a truck. Yes, that truck. It's a perfectly scaled down MP10, although with surprisingly more greebles added to it to fit into the Earth Siege aesthetic. And you know what? It's pretty good. Now I admit I do not hold as much of a nostalgic mindset to the flat-nosed G1 truck as most people. I did grow up with G1, but to be honest, Optimus Prime's vehicle modes, whether this style or the movie, haven't been the kind that really stuck with me throughout my childhood. So from a completely neutral standpoint, they did a bang-up job replicating the G1 toy and cartoon in a more modernized aesthetic. Right off the bat, the actual plastic quality is done quite well. Between this Siege and Studio Series, this easily has to be the chunkiest plastic out of the three. And I'm not just referring to the density of parts. There's a very nice weight and solidity to every piece across all three types of plastic. I also love that the red plastic especially falls on the Studio Series side of detail, where nothing gets washed out. Yes, no longer do we have to deal with the softened details that really acted as a detriment to the Siege version. But even with that, there's a lovely shine to everything, especially on the blue. So in essence, he both looks good and feels fun to handle. For the most iconic Transformer on the planet, or maybe the second, since I don't really know whether he's more or less so than Bumblebee, these two elements definitely elevate the build quality to a level where fans outside of Transformers would have a hard time finding faults. The best element of the truck would easily have to be the front, although that's not to say the back is bad in any way. Well, Actually, it kind of is, but let's save that for a bit. For starters, the paint is done amazingly well, and it perfectly complements the silver accents that dot the front and sides. Now, yes, pretty much all the paint is silver, and unfortunately you don't get any yellow on the top lights, but the amount of silver is certainly a sight to behold. The window edges pop immensely, and the grill draws your gaze to the clear blue headlights. They've used clear plastic on top of painted silver, which works amazingly. I honestly wish more Transformers would do this, instead of just showing you the kibble underneath. It's a far more elegant way of doing things, even if it requires a higher paint budget 
dodge it. One thing that really gets me is the fact that the stripe properly travels to the back of the vehicle. It's not the most consistent around the corners, but it's consistent enough and greatly lowers the cohesion of his siege counterpart. I mean, come on, what the f*** is this? And yes, the windows do look a little stupid on the sides, but considering what they ultimately have to do during the transformation, I think this is a good compromise. And at the very least, they're handled much better than the Masterpiece version. Yes, I'm referring to both, as MP44 loses by default from going overboard on the faux parts. I don't hate faux parts, in fact, Earthrise Optimus does have quite a few, but there was a point that they clearly had to stop and they flat out didn't. The silver also continues on the sides and inner sections of the wheels, although for some weird reason, the front wheels aren't painted in silver at all. Instead, they're cast in grey and have the tyres painted black. I suppose it's alright, but it does stand out when compared to the silver ones at the back, and yes, I have noticed where these wheels come from, I'll get to that in a minute. But first, the only real difference in paint is the second smaller grille above the first one. It's done in a slightly darker metallic paint to the rest, and I'm not really sure why. What's more, it doesn't really match up with the gunmetal on anywhere else in the figure, so it is somewhat peculiar. But whatever, it looks cool and I'll happily take it. You also get colour correction red around the window section, and I don't think I've seen something this seamless on a mainline transformer before. For most angles, you flat out cannot tell it's paint, and not plastic at all. I know I've already briefly mentioned the detail, but Jesus Christ, it works really well. I mean, yeah, you've got arm hinges on the roof here, but it's really negligible. And sure, the robot stand port is kind of visible from the front, but it's so minor. I mean, I guess you could also complain that the back section is kind of hollow, but that leads into some of the weapon storage later, which I'll get to. And when it comes to the back, it's hardly an issue worth mentioning, because, let's face it, there are far worse things going on. I'm just gonna put this out there, the back section pretty much lacks any flow. You get to a certain point where the cohesive front of the truck just stops, and you're left with just a weird mess on the back. I'm not expecting the amazing panel forming that SS38 underwent, because that was pretty much lightning in a bottle that will most likely not be replicated for another few years. All I ask is that the truck flows from front to back, and in this instance, it really doesn't. I mean, just take a look at the canister section. They transform similar to SS38, but when juxtaposed with the cab up front, there's just no flowing kibble to make it blend properly. Not to mention you've got painted silver clashing with unpainted Games Workshop grey, which, believe me, I'll get to. And yes, the blue plastic is absolutely pristine, but thanks to the new way they've designed this, the legs are already clearly separated. I'm used to Optimus Primes just having their legs sticking out the back, but this seems like an especially egregious example. There is a simple reason why the back section flat out doesn't work. This figure reuses parts from the Siege mold, and I mean a lot of parts. Pretty much the entire shell of the legs is ripped straight from it, to the point where you can still see some of the joints poking out of the back as artifacts from another time. Furthermore, the feet and these weird panels on the side remain the same. Although in this case it's far less frustrating. The problem is Siege was designed to have a specific transformation using a secondary thigh swivel, but Earthrise lacks that extra thigh swivel and is slightly wider, so it has to compensate in order to add a new trailer hitch. Had they outright reused the same legs with no modifications, they would have no room for the new trailer hitch to properly connect. And that makes me wonder, why didn't they just make these sections blue? I imagine it's budgeting and tooling reasons, but for a leader class it does seem a little bit cheap in my humble opinion. When the classics version from almost a decade and a half prior has a more cohesive back section, you know some poor decisions were made. Also, eagle-eyed viewers may have noticed that I have this fellow mistransformed. All this is because, as said earlier, due to the lack of a secondary thigh swivel, the legs have been purposefully assembled backwards, placing the panels that previously opened up on the opposite sides. And this causes a very stupid side effect. I realise that purposefully mistransforming a figure can typically be rather unfair, but take a look at what the end result of the actual transformation is. Like, Jesus f Christ, did they have to put them on in the same way? What purpose did leaving them swapped have? Now you just left with a random 5mm port on the side, which looks like a disgusting growth that accomplishes nothing. I'm half tempted to modify this in order to have the port covered up whilst still retaining this element of transformation, but I've held off from doing so since I did plan on doing this review in the meantime. Suffice to say though, whilst I have no problems with reusing parts from other figures, as far as the vehicle mode is concerned, they did so incredibly poorly. Those aren't the only parts he reuses though, he also reuses the wheels from the Studio Series long-nosed truck version. Now, as far as complaints for this goes, I really don't get it. I mean, yes, they don't quite match up, and it does make the front one stand out quite a bit, but it's just wheels, for God's sake. I've seen many people complain about this element, but I'm sorry, I just can't get on board with that. It's incredibly nitpicky. So yes, if we're discussing the truck mode on its own, with no accessories added, there's a lot of good and a lot of bad. When compared to the War for Cybertron S11 version, the differences in approaches become extremely apparent, and I'm not just talking about the aesthetic of the alt mode. The Siege version is a brilliant concept, but thanks to the pretty weak plastic and the somewhat inconsistent 
consistent paintwork, the execution ultimately falls flat. Meanwhile, let's be honest, Earthrise's vehicle mode is a pretty boring and done to death concept, despite what a lot of G1ers will say. However, in spite of a lot of its flaws, particularly in the back section, I can safely say that the execution outweighs that. The sculpt work, paint work, plastic density, plastic colour and sheer chunkitude easily give this an advantage over his predecessor. Ultimately, what we have gives us the final verdicts, not what they were trying to do at a conceptual level. That's not to say that an interesting concept and an interesting toy are the same thing though. SS38 was an interesting toy that physically tried to do a whole lot, not just in concept. As such, in vehicle mode, I do feel that SS38 just gets the slight advantage, but not by much. SS38 has the much better looking truck mode by far, but the Earthrise version is slightly built better. So ignoring Siege Prime, as far as vehicle mode is concerned, I do think there's at least some form of argument to buy one or the other, if you're not a stickler who only wants one of them as Prime in their collection. And thank f I'm not. However, a lot of the final decision relies on the engineering in the robot mode, but before we can get into that, we need to cover the accessories. Optimus Prime comes with this typical Ion Blaster, and not an Ion Cannon, as I've somehow mistakenly called it in previous reviews. Must have had Clone Wars on the brain at the time. As far as G1 Prime Blasters go, this is easily one of the better ones. They clearly took the complaints about how the Siege one looked and made improvements. The grey pegs may seem a little unsightly, but they do serve a purpose for storage. Speaking of, it stores on the back of the vehicle mode. I'll admit this sadly isn't the most seamless storage in the world, but this is a mainline generations release, which isn't exactly known for its weapon storage now, is it? I mean, sure, Studio Series has been doing an amazing job with weapon storage recently, but when compared to the contemporaries in this particular line, it is quite good. And then we get to the trailer. Look, I'll be the first to admit I typically don't really give a damn about trailers for Optimai, but in this instance, considering mainline mainly doesn't do these, I do understand the appeal. But I don't know, something just feels off. I mean, it does have some pretty nice features. You've got a kickstand, which is nice for display. Whilst you do have to open it up to bring down the ramp, it does have one, and it can fit smaller deluxes inside it, as well as connect to the ramp system, and no, I refuse to refer to it by its official name as it has nothing to do with an actual airlock. The inside is filled with tons of 5mm ports, echoing back to the classic fans project upgrade trailers with storage for all your generation's figures weapons. The robot's Thingo extends with three points of articulations on its hinges and ball jointed arms. I actually really like the decision to make both arms claws. This deviation actually gives it a lot of personality, and this time you're not only just able to rotate it upwards for the base mode, or at least I think it's a base mode, but you're also able to remove it entirely. You do have to flip it over in order to let it sit flush against the ground, but this adds a whole extra level of play value. But even then, after all these features, I can't help but feel something's missing. Now granted, a lot of these issues are fine on their own, but when you put them together, it definitely feels subpar. First off, the plastic. I'm sorry, but it's just not good. It's shiny, I'll give you that, but it feels like they've taken Games Workshop grey and just upped the brightness in Photoshop. It's not the worst thing I've seen, and it doesn't wash out the detail completely, but it just looks cheap. It also feels cheap too, compared to the chunkiness of the main body, this is a massive letdown. I feel had they gone for the gunmetal that was already being used elsewhere on the figure, going for a more toon aesthetic, they could have skirted around the budgeting issues, but this decision here looks incredibly bland. Secondly, the stripe feels underdone too. I'm fine with them deviating from the formula, and I'll be the first to admit that it's way better than omitting it entirely, like the Dark of the Moon Studio Series version, but what we have here really misses the point. I'm not complaining because it's not G1 accurate, I'm only complaining because it's f***ing boring. And finally, the entire underside section just feels underdone. It took me a while to figure out what was missing, as at first it seemed okay at the very least. I mean sure, there were several complaints about the back section being a little hollow, but there's a limit to what you can do with the leader size class. But then, after seeing the work that Non-F Productions has done with his kits, I began to realise what went wrong. There's virtually no detail on the underside at all. I mean, I can forgive the back, but where are the outward struts? They didn't even mould them in. And again, this issue, as well as the others, are completely fine in a vacuum. If one or even two of these issues were there, I would have easily ignored them. However, unfortunately, with them forming a perfect trinity, they become really glaring. It feels like they didn't put much effort into this trailer. It just needed that tiny extra push to make it a worthwhile accessory. I mean, just look at the aforementioned Dark of the Moon Optimus Prime trailer. Yes, the paint on the trailer itself is pretty garbage by virtue of there not being any, but when you consider the amount of weapons he comes with, as well as the massive transformation it goes through, it becomes easily forgivable. Thanks to the sheer dedication to pulling this off, minor issues such as the lack of spikes and the use of a fake wheel become incredibly negligible. And sure, as a Voyager, Dark of the Moon Optimus Prime is a much simpler beast. He was designed 100% for the Voyager price point before being redecoed at the leader one. Earthrise Optimus Prime is designed as a leader first, and believe me, you'll see how he makes use of his extra budget later on. So there isn't quite a full $40 budget for this trailer like there was with the Dark of the Moon one. However, the dedication to pulling it off is far different. With the Earthrise version, it feels more like they did this out of obligation, as opposed to actually giving a damn. Also, despite all of his retooling,
the trailer hitch remains way too far forward. I don't understand this decision. They literally had no reason to do this. As such, although being reasonably articulated, it does remain somewhat limited. So yeah, the trailer is a bit shit to say the least, but unsurprisingly, Optimus Prime does end up looking quite good with it. It's quite a common occurrence to have an Optimus look 10 times better with a trailer than without, and this is no exception. In fact, the only case I can think of where this hasn't worked is the hybrid style, but that's for obvious reasons. No, I haven't smashed my copy. Yes, he is garbage, but that would be a complete waste of money. In terms of cross compatibility, you do get quite a few options. The Siege version works well enough, but it's placed even further forward than the Earthrise version, so aside from looking terrible, it gets practically no rotation. The way in which it sits works fine on the Bumblebee Movie Studio Series rendition, but due to the proportions, it ends up looking way too undersized. Thankfully, it works great on both long nosed versions, despite a slightly loose fit, but if you're gonna use it for that, why not just buy SS44? And finally, moving out of this bloated vehicle mode section, size wise, he's actually quite small for a Voyager, even if the trailer adds on a bunch of extra mass. You'll understand why later, though, so honestly, I don't mind, especially after Astro Train justified his price point. Now, yeah, I've been incredibly critical on the vehicle mode throughout this review, and maybe it's partially because I don't find this concept all that interesting, but to be honest, that's because most of his flaws pertain to said vehicle mode. It may seem ranty to front end all of my complaints into the starts of the video, but believe me, we are on to clear skies from here on out. Earthrise Optimus Prime is very simple. Possibly too simple by someone's unrealistic standards of what Voyager class Transformers should be, but what he does is very intuitive and fun. In fact, you pretty much won't be able to stop transforming this for at least a few days when you first get it. First thing you want to do is remove the gun, of course, because why wouldn't you? Then you've got three panels to untab on each side. One, two, and three, and they all have hooks that allow you to get in there. Come underneath and collapse the canisters, just like the SS-38, and then rotate the waist section down like that. And of course, the arms do an Optimus from here. Then after getting them out of the way, you take this whole front section and rotate it upwards, revealing the midriff. And then you've got a second hinge that untabs from there, and then very much like the Siege version of Optimus Prime, you fold in the panels, well, at least four of them anyway, and then you also fold the panels in on itself to cover up the grill section. You then come around to the back and push in these side torso sections. Push this down a little bit, but not all the way, just so that you've got enough access or clearance for this head panel that pops out, and then the whole head pops out like so into place, and you have a tab there and a slot there, and it tabs back in together, locking it into place much more sturdily than the Siege version. And then you can push this section back into place, and back into place. Yeah, it's faux parts, but at least it's consistent. You're going from one type of grill to the same type of grill, and at least it goes into the chest and doesn't just form a god-awful backpack. These types of faux parts aren't cheating, they're doing something incredibly clever. But anyway, you rotate this section around 180 degrees, well, it's the waist swivel, but then that allows you to push this up, and collapse the final two panels along his back. So he does have back kibble, or rather butt kibble, but it works fine. And the legs separate, the panels pop down if you haven't mistranslated transforms them like I did for most of the review, and the feet pop out on two separate hinges. I do kind of wish the feet had more to them, they seem a bit simple, especially given the issues in the vehicle mode, but oh well, they get the job done. And then last but not least, you open up this panel and then fold out the hand, very much like a masterpiece figure. In fact, you've then got a tab there and a slot there, and that locks the hand into place. You know that most mainline figures would just leave that hollow, so the fact that they did this really makes him feel far more premium than he would normally. So yeah, that's your lot really. It's pretty simple, but it's incredibly addictive. Once you get him in hand, you really start to realise why he's so loved, not just amongst the G1 community, but also amongst regular Transformers fans in general. Vehicle mode had a lot of good and a lot of bad, but in robot mode I can see why they sacrificed a lot of what they did. Ultimately, this is a figure made for its robot mode, and whilst it may be disappointing that they didn't pull out all of the engineering stops and make both modes work perfectly, it's hard to deny that the end result is extremely well realised. Like right off the bat, this almost looks as perfect as the Masterpiece version, aside from one tiny element of kibble on the back. I mean, yeah, the wheels are a smidge awkward, but that's your lot, really. Everything else is a pretty much perfect modernization of the on-screen counterpart. The head sculpt is quintessentially Optimus, even if 
if it, like many other vehicle mode parts, is ripped straight from the Siege version. I mean, sure, the eyes do look a bit sunken in thanks to the lack of a silver trim around them, but they more than make up for it with this lovely metallic blue finish, which also carries over to the hands. I'm a bit confused as to why they didn't ultimately go with the yellow toy accurate eyes, not because I prefer any particular form of accuracy, but because that was such a heavy part of the marketing. In fact, there were several different factory samples produced, each with slightly different eye and leg configurations. So until this figure came out, we had no idea how these elements were going to look. It's clear that this figure went through some changes, and that's probably what accounts for the lack of silver around the eyes. Still, I'm sure there's a way to modify it and fix it up, and to the very least, the paint isn't as messy as it is on the Siege version. Like, seriously. Hey yo, what the f the chest section works surprisingly well, again like most versions in mainline, the windows remain real whilst the midriff section and the waist do not. To some it might seem like exactly the same thing that the Siege version pulled off, but under analysis, Siege takes a really cool vehicle mode idea and then hides this on his back in a cumbersome backpack. Jetpack style or no, at least Earthrise Prime stays consistent and it folds up neatly into his chest, I don't mind faux pas to be honest, and here they managed to do it correctly. I mean sure the paint isn't the cleanest and it came pre-scratched from the factory which is a bit of a bummer, but apparently that's just my copy so I imagine yours will be fine. And oh my word, I cannot believe I completely forgot about the matrix cavity in the script. Yes, you've got a matrix and yes, it does come out. Albeit a smidge difficultly, but eventually it gets out of there. And it's a tiny little matrix, all right, with some lovely clear blue plastic. And I suppose he can kind of hold it on his thumb, but as typical, it's way too small, but that's just how Optimus's be, considering the mass shifting the Matrix does to fit inside of his torso. It's, it's just something that happens, you can't really do it on a Transformer period. But they did this on a mainline toy, so that's actually pretty cool. The arms remain far cleaner than any of his predecessors, whilst still echoing the powerful silhouette. Yes, no stupid proportions like with Wheeljack, thankfully. And as an added bonus, the hands are actually articulated at the knuckle. This is a really nice feature, and whilst I would have gladly sacrificed it in order to make the trailer potentially better, I am glad it's here. And the best part is, despite being painted over in metallic blue, it remains incredibly durable. No paint chipping whatsoever. Starscream, take notes. It also looks surprisingly natural, which is something you wouldn't really expect, especially on a mainline Transformer. Kudos to the designers. We need more Transformers official and unofficial, like this in the general fandom consciousness. Now I've seen people complain about the proportions and the design of the waist section, and I do kinda get some of it. In photos and videos, including probably this one, it definitely looks like his chest is way too short and his waist looks like a giant oversized diaper. Whilst I unfortunately can't show it very well, I can tell you that in person it doesn't come across as such. As a 3D object in front of you, it works incredibly well, it's just unfortunate that on the interweb it's borderline impossible to convey such a fact. Then there's the complaints that they moulded in his hip into the waist instead of using a hip skirt. I'm sorry, but what? Did you see what happened to the Siege version? And even then, a hip skirt can only do so much. A proper hip joint is always infinitely more articulated. I mean, sure, thanks to the kibble, he can't move backwards for shit. But that's not thanks to the hip design, and front movement is way more important, and with a hip skirt you can't really achieve that. Well, you can, but it takes a lot of joints. This is how Transformers should be engineered, and I'm sorry if you think that Gundam is the pinnacle of engineering, it really isn't. That's not to say I don't have any complaints about this section, because I do. I mean, the yellow is still pretty awful, barely popping out against the lackluster silver plastic, which makes a return from the trailer, but for the first complaint, yellow is an incredibly difficult colour to do, and this is typically the norm for Transformers, despite the figures I've reviewed recently. And two, well, we've already got gone over this in the vehicle mode, so why does it matter that much? Then moving on to the lower legs, yep, they're Siege legs alright. I'll admit they aren't perfect, especially considering the way they covered up the remaining joints from the Siege version. Whilst I don't see how they could have done it better, it does look pretty unsightly. The greebling doesn't have any flow to it, and it's made even worse by the silver plastic. But hey, it retains roughly the same posability as his predecessor, and the shiny plastic really does make them look far more premium. Sure, they're simple, but they get the job done. I really do wish they underwent some more transformation though, not necessarily to hide the wheels, since showing truck parts is fine, but just in some form. But what we have here isn't bad at all. Ultimately, it's a very well-realized robot mode. See, for people like myself, this might have seemed like a pretty pointless Optimus Prime design. And in some respects, in fact in most respects, we are right. Take a look at a lot of the Generations Primes that came out in recent years. Most of them have been G1 1984 related in some shape or form, but in discussing with members of the G1 community, I've come to the understanding that those were all bastardizations in their eyes. Not in the sense that they weren't G1 enough, but in the sense that they were kinda shit. When you realise that, the reuse of parts and slight blemishes make sense. I'm not saying that this is definitively what happened, but it's likely that Hasbro decided very late in production that this was the Optimus Prime that was going to be made, in order to finally satisfy that group of fans. And now that we're done, we should be able to finally move on. Hopefully. If we get an even more G1-ified Optimus Prime in the third part of the trilogy, then I'll know Haztac is just f***ing.
working with us. And despite reusing several elements from Siege and even Studio Series, at the very least he doesn't exhibit what I like to call Earthrise laziness. I'm sure I'm not the only one who thinks this, but there are a lot of toys in this line that just feel kinda underdone. I mean, Cliff Jumper is fun and all, a pretty decent figure, but there had to be a way to engineer him without the parts forming, but who cares, I guess, because he's G1! Grapple is an incredibly fun toy, but he lacks so much paint, to the point where painting the head black and adding repro labels seems like a requirement, but he looked that bland in the cartoon, so who cares, I guess, since he's G1! Starscream I've already covered in great detail. He should have been re-engineered a lot more instead of just borrowing everything from his decade and a half old classics predecessor, but who cares, I guess, because he's G1! And please, don't get me started on Hoist. Please don't get me started on Double Dealer. Please, please, please don't get me started on RC. Part of the reason I like this guy so much is because he rises above a lot of that in a way that I've only seen a few other figures in this line do. And believe me, I'll get to those eventually. He's just a simple Optimus Prime that's supposed to remain the definitive G1 experience. And if this really is the last one for a while, as I hope it is, then what a way to end on. Whilst SS38 represents the great tapestry of the immense Optimus Prime collective, Earthrise Prime represents the nostalgia that G1 has have had for the past 35 or so years. I don't know how long it's been, to be honest. The thing is, the robot mode and transformation are done so well that even those who don't particularly care about the G1 cartoon or toy line can still have a lot of fun with him. I mean, sure, the trailer is still a bit of a shit show, but that's par for the course for this new leader class now, isn't it? Accessory-wise, the Iron Blaster has a brand new configuration for you to go through on the back, and it's done in such a way that it doesn't really mess with the waist swivel. That small detail is a very nice touch. It also folds out, as you'd expect, and it looks very nice in hand. I do wish they'd sculpted a trigger finger, but Ah oh well, you can't win them all. Hidden in the trailer, you can also find a buckler, similar to the Siege one, although not terrible since it's not way too thick. Not gonna lie, this actually works. It's small, but it definitely works far better. I've seen complaints that this replaces the traditional door system, but I quite like this, and even with it removed, the RAM functionality is still mostly there. Very nice touch. You can even attach the claw robot if you so desire, but as funny as it is, I find this pretty stupid, but whatever floats your boat. Sadly, he does not come with an axe or anything similar. I learned recently in a podcast that you can kind of fit Siege Prime's axe in the hand groove using the two pegs, but I'm to try it myself. Yeah, it's not the best fit. There's no way this was intentional. I'm not sure if the podcast episode will be up by the time I complete this video, but I'll leave a link to it if it is. So ultimately, aside from the trailer, Optimus Prime is pretty modest accessory-wise, but I'm usually fine with that, provided they deliver an incredibly solid robot mode, and in this case, they definitely did. Articulation remains very good as well. The head remains as well articulated as it was in C, with its ball joint, but thankfully you don't have to deal with the stupid panel wobbling about. He has a universal shoulder with no stupid panel sticking out this time, thank God. And due to the transformation, his arm goes back pretty much all the way, this time thanks to there being no stupid jetpack. You've also got your standard bicep swivel, 90 degree elbow, and wrist swivel, but as stated earlier, the knuckle crunch is what really sells it. The waist doesn't quite swivel all the way due to the wheel kibble, but it does get enough to be mostly expressive, and if you so desire you can move the kibble out of the way, or if you're feeling brave enough, remove it entirely. I'm not feeling that brave though, I don't want to break anything, definitely do your research before pulling this off. Unfortunately, removal or not, there's virtually no backward motion on the universal hips, but the outward and forward motion works pretty much as well as you'd hope. Again, and I don't know why they made Siege Prime the way they did. Whilst you lose the secondary thigh swivel that the Siege version had, you really don't need it this time, since the regular thigh swivel actually works properly. The knee also gets you plenty of bend. In fact, it's as much as the Siege version, as stated earlier. Finally, the ankles are roughly the same, so it's business as usual. So yeah, most poses work pretty perfectly this time, which perfectly complements the extra size he gains. Whilst the parts count isn't as high as Astro Train, it's easily still higher than your standard Voyager. And what he lacks for in parts count, he easily makes up for in height. So no, I don't think this figure could have been sold at the Voyager price point without the trailer, at least without some immense kibble sacrifices or maybe removing the transparent elements entirely. As frustrating and as bland as the trailer is, I do think he is ultimately worth the $90 price tag, much like Astro Train was before him. I still think that Astro Train has a more interesting transformation, but I can't deny that the execution of Optimus Prime is top notch. And that's where comparing this to older versions gets a little confusing, because I've already discussed the difference in what was attempted and what was executed before in my Siege vs Studio Series review, so to explain where I'm coming from is going to be a little, uh, odd. See, there are many different ways in which a figure can attempt certain things. There's the conceptual level, and then there's the engineering level. When it came to exploring why Siege Prime was ultimately worse than SS38, both of those were taking things at face value at the engineering level. Siege Prime was a perfect execution of a boring engineering experience, whereas the Bumblebee movie one took risks and tried new things, even if it ultimately didn't succeed in every single category. That might seem like I'm somewhat retconning what I said back in episode 52, but when you watch this in tandem with that review, hopefully it'll make sense in the fact that I'm really not 
doing so. So let's take Siege Prime out of the picture, because the sooner we forget about that, the better. Between SS38 and Earthrise 11, these two are coming from very different production layouts. The Studio Series version was a brand new and interesting concept, translated into a brand new and interesting transformation scheme, and ultimately did it not perfectly, but very well. Earthrise Prime was a boring concept, <laughs> translated into a familiar but still very well executed transformation scheme, and has, again, a not perfect but a very well executed full package. Studio Series Prime has issues with its robot mode solidity, and Earthrise Prime has issues with its vehicle mode, but ultimately these two exist as the pinnacle of what they're trying to do with the mainline price point. So ultimately, I don't think one is better than the other. Yes, this might seem like a cop-out, but honestly I think they both excel in their own fields, and are both 100% must-haves for Transformers fans. I pity those who insist on only having one version of each character, because in cases like this you're really damned to only get one half of the adventure. Feel free to criticise me as much as you like, but ultimately I have to remain honest to myself. And if that costs me a couple of negative comments, then so be it. Maybe when I first received Earthrise Optimus Prime, I would have said that he was far better than the Studio Series version, but that's why it's important to wait a bit and truly get a feel for each figure before you review them. So I am glad that I delayed this review for this long, even if it was made even longer by some laptop issues. Unsurprisingly, this means that this figure receives a perfect score. That doesn't make it perfect by any means, especially given the issues with its vehicle mode, but no figure truly is, and the perfect score merely dictates that the figure is at the top of its class. I mean, if there's one last thing I really want to scrape out of the bottom of the barrel to complain about, it's the fact that the repaints are kind of boring. We could have gotten so many amazing repaints, but apparently Hasbro decided that a corpse was the most appropriate one for 2020. I mean, yeah, I guess it kind of is given the apocalypse, but toys are supposed to distract you from the real world, aren't they? Now at the time of recording this, it is the end of the financial year, which means that toy sales are sweeping across the country of Australia, meaning that in some places Optimus Prime is going as far down as half its original price. However, given the popularity of this character, he is selling out quite quickly, and all things considered, I still think he is worth full price. Much like Astro Train before him, I really suggest you go out and grab him right now. Don't be stingy, he is definitely worth the $80 to $90 price tag. So maybe Earthrise isn't the greatest line, caked in layers and layers of disappointment, but Optimus Prime truly manages to rise above most of it. And you know what? That is one of the most fitting elements the character could have. And if you ask me, that is pretty poignant. Hey, you! Yes, you, the schmuck who's watching this video! Are you an Aussie Transformers fan who's finding it very difficult to find stock on shelves these days, especially with the current apocalypse? Well, I have a solution to that. Today's video has been sponsored by Robotoys, an Australian Transformers store with a brilliant track record. If you're looking for Hasbro, Takara, third party, or knockoff figures, they cover all the bases, so if you're looking for it, they likely have it. If you so desire, you can use the code DRLOCK 10% off at the checkout for a single use 10% off on a single purchase. I know I said single twice, but who cares? They were the ones who provided me with this figure that I reviewed today, and I highly recommend them, even if I wasn't sponsored. So give them a check out, and I'll see you next episode. Ah.